Thanks, Doris, and good afternoon. A little bit of a sound check here. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. All right, great. So again, my name's Ray Kim, and it's a privilege to be here. Um, uh, just kind of my journey here, it uh, started in Rochester, Minnesota. Spent five cold winters uh, training in orthopedics. Uh, then moved to New York City, did my fellowship at Insol Scott Kelly, and then came to Colorado, and I was in Denver for the past 11 years, and uh, really a privilege to be here uh, since February. So it's great to see a bunch of familiar faces and some new faces, and I've got a bunch of slides here, and these are more placeholders, but this is really meant to be a conversation, so uh, feel free to interrupt uh, throughout the talk. Um, and if you have questions, raise your hand. We've got a floating microphone that can come around, and um, in all honesty, I want you to be able to ask questions, so, so feel free. So we're gonna talk about a few things here, uh, more angled on the surgical approach, and the surgery aspects of hip and knee replacement, and Ashley's gonna to talk to you more about the physical therapy piece. Um, so we're gonna answer a couple questions. What is arthritis? So, a show of hands here, how many know what arthritis is? Okay, tell me, what, Cindy, tell me what arthritis is. Lots of aches and pains. Aches and pains, okay. What else comes to your mind when you think about arthritis? Scott? Inflammation. Inflammation, great. Inflammation. You can't move. You can't move. Trouble with function and movement. Flexibility. Lack of flexibility. What else comes to your mind? Cartilage damage. Cartilage damage, exactly. So, so what is cartilage? We're going to talk about cartilage. Does anybody know what this is here? It's like a chair. A chair. What's the chair made of? This is, this is a piece of art that I found on the internet. It's amazing what you can find on the internet. <laughs> These chairs are actually made of chicken bones. And if anybody's seen the end of a chicken bone, what you see is that white, shiny, glistening surface, and that's called articular cartilage. When that cartilage wears away, that's basically arthritis. And so cartilage itself doesn't have any nerve endings, but the bone underneath has nerve endings. So when the, when the cartilage is worn down, that bone grinding on bone is very painful. And just like what some of the folks mentioned here, when you have arthritis, you get pain. And pain is really what limits you and keeps you from doing the things that you want to do. You get stiffness, you get swelling. And when we see you in the office, we really don't need a lot of fancy tests. We can actually diagnose and understand what's going on with your hip or knee with some simple things. One is what we call the history of your hip or knee. So it's the story of what you've experienced. So usually, it's, it's a, long, um, a long standing history of pain that has maybe started with a little injury or incident and then progressed and eventually got worse over time. Uh, sometimes people have pain even to the point where it's painful at night. You try, what do you do when you have pain? What are some of the simple treatments that you can Aleve. encounter? Aleve, Advil, so some simple medications. What else, what are some other home remedies? Massage, yep. That can make your pain better or make it, make it feel better? Synvisc. Synvisc, okay, some injections. Back there. Ointments. Ointments, yeah, some topical things, creams and, and so forth. What else? Cortisone, yes. Yoga. Yoga, yoga's great. So there are some other uh, therapy modalities and we're gonna let Ashley address those things and um, simple treatments that can sometimes get you better. Then we examine your hip or knee. So we'll take a look at you. There's some certain tests. We can look at the range of motion or how it bends and straightens and moves. Uh, we watch how you walk. And pe patients don't realize it, but we actually start examining you from the moment you're walking into the room. So we'll sneak up behind you and watch Mr. Smith or Mrs. Jones walk. And we can tell it's a, a favorite pastime, pastime of mine. I'll, I'll sit in a mall and watch people walk and try to diagnose what their ailment is. So <laughs> try to figure out, is it a back problem? Is it a hip problem? Is it a knee problem? There's very specific limps uh, that occur with each one of these types of pathologies. And then we look at x-rays. You know, there are a lot of fancy tests, MRIs, CT scans, very expensive tests. But we can gather 99% of the information that we need with just these three simple things here. So what are the treatment options? Well, you've already mentioned a lot of the things, and we keep it pretty simple in how we treat hip and knee arthritis. There's basically two broad categories. One is what we call non-surgical, things that don't involve surgery, yoga, Aleve, Advil, uh, and then surgical treatment options. And really, joint replacement is kind of the last resort. So there's other types of surgeries and treatments that can sometimes be, um, address simple little things, 
But when the cartilage is completely gone, so kind of like, uh, let's use the road analogy. If you have a little pothole, sometimes you can patch the little pothole, but if the whole pavement's gone, you're basically looking at joint replacement. So I used to include surgical videos, and the last time we had a <laughs> gathering like this, it was over a dinner, and uh, a number of people had to leave the room, so we're gonna keep it pretty simple. So has anybody ever seen a knee replacement or hip replacement on uh, YouTube or some videos? Okay, a couple people here. So the general perception when people think about, let's, let's take the knee first, a knee replacement, people think you're taking out the knee from here to here, and you're putting a big chunk of metal. And that's actually not the case. So all we're really doing is we're removing a thin layer of the arthritic surface, and we're placing a cap on the end of the thigh bone, and then a tray on the top of the shin bone, and then there's a bearing that snaps in between there. And so if we had to name this operation today in 2017, we'd probably call this a knee resurfacing as opposed to a knee replacement. Similarly, in the hip side, the hip, it's a pretty simple joint. It's a ball and socket, okay? Uh, some orthopedic surgeons joke how it's a dumb joint. It's just a ball and socket. Uh, on the socket side, we, we remove the arthritic cartilage. We place a titanium shell in there. There's a bearing that snaps in there. And on the thigh bone side, we remove the arthritic ball. There's a titanium stem that gets placed into the bone. And then there's a ceramic ball that sits on top of that. And so that's really the entire surgery right there. So we'll spare you from seeing some surgical videos and allow you to digest your lunches. <laughs> Any questions about the surgeries? Pretty simple. If you saw our, our toolbox, it would look very much like tools in a wood shop. Our tools are just a little bit cleaner. So people always ask, well, what's new in the world of joint replacements? Has anybody heard about things in the news or in, on commercials, things that are new. We had a couple conversations, uh, yes? Less, less invasive surgery. Less invasive surgery. Yeah, that's a great, a great topic. So uh, in the old days, has anybody here had a joint placement from let's say over 20 years ago or 15 years ago? Okay, so a handful here. And it's pretty, you know, obviously a very common operation. Doris mentioned how it's, it's very, common procedure. Um, anybody have a, a guess as to how, how many uh, Americans over the age of 65 have joint replacements, have near hip replacements? Or what, what the incident? So not quite that high, that's, that's quite, quite a few. But I, actually one in five Americans over the age of 65 have a hip or knee replacement. So these are very, very common operations. Hip replacements have been done since 19, the 1960s. Knee replacements have been done since the 1970s. And if you look at the way that hips and knees have been done back in the couple decades ago, you know, it was a pretty extensive incision. It's a good foot long or more incision. And there wasn't a whole lot of care towards minimizing the soft tissue trauma or the, the injury uh, to the tissues below the skin as well. And so these were pretty traumatic uh, surgeries and patients would typically stay in the hospital for many, many days. And what we have figured out over the years is that you don't need a foot-long incision. You could do it through a smaller incision. And what's more important is how you handle the tissues and the bones and the ligaments and tendons underneath the skin. So using careful surgical technique, using some sleight of hand and magic tricks and using some fancier instruments, we can do these operations with less trauma. Um, there's been modernized anesthesia techniques. Um, let me advance my slide here some improved an anesthesia techniques. Um, so we're even doing these surgeries outpatient now. Uh, so we, this morning, spent uh, the morning doing a bunch of outpatient joint surgeries. So as, as much as we'd like to take the credit for the advancements, we do have to give credit to the anesthesiologists. You know, the industry has come a long way in improving the, the bearings and the, um, and the longevity and survivorship of the, of the implants. Um, the instruments that we use are fancier, so we have what we call computer navigation, we have imaging techniques to make sure that the parts are dialed in to, to the exact position that we want them to be. Uh, so joint replacements have come a long way. So yes, uh, what we call the minimally invasive or less invasive uh, surgery, that's, that's for the most part how I would say a lot of surgeons are doing their, their hip and knee replacements nowadays. 
What else? Has anybody else heard about different technologies? Yes. Robotics. Robotics, a very common thing that uh, certain companies are pushing, a very popular uh, tool. Uh, so really what robotics is, is it's a tool. So the perception is, is that the surgeon is in a, a dark room, they press a button, and this robot is you know, doing the surgery for them, and that's actually not the case. So really it's just an instrument or tool to help uh, prepare the bone cuts. And uh, I was having a conversation with somebody earlier. Um, joint placement, although it looks like it's just a bunch of carpentry, there's actually a whole nother facet of joint placements that involves the soft tissue handling. And we know that robotics are great for making the bone cuts, but as surgeons, we actually know that the bone cuts are the easiest part of the operation. We can actually train a monkey how to do the bone cuts. Uh, how you handle the soft tissues, how you balance the ligaments, uh, that's a very important part of the hip replacement that the robot actually cannot do. But yes, it's a tool that's, that's uh, uh, out on the market now. Does it actually improve the outcomes, improve efficiencies? Uh, that has yet to be borne out, but uh, so certainly something that can be used in the future. Other, uh, yes? What about freezing of the nerve to eliminate the pain? Yeah, there's a new gadget out there that uh, in terms of treating knee arthritis uh, before surgery or sometimes even for after surgery, there's a, a, a technology that allows you to freeze some of the skin nerves around the knee to help reduce some of the soreness. Um, so I don't know if, uh, are any of the therapy folks using any of this cryo technology? Um, so yeah, there's, there's some technology and that, that may be a good way to try to avoid surgery uh, and may give you some temporary pain relief. Um, and the bottom line is I, I would say for any of these new uh, technologies that can help you avoid surgery, that's, you know, if, if you feel like it's helping, uh, by all means, keep, keep trying it. Uh, if it. If it's not working anymore, that's when people start entertaining um, is joint replacement. Um, it is. I, I know there's some places, around, um, some physical medicine and rehabilitation physicians are using it to try to help patients buy some more time out of their joint. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's a question right over here. You talked about saving the soft, soft tissues or protecting them. Yes. What Right, so I would venture to guess probably half the people here that have, have skied in the past don't have their ACL or maybe have had it repaired or reconstructed. Um, so the nice thing about knee replacements is that the ACL is removed anyways as part of the surgery. So you've actually done part of the job for us. So you, you've just saved us a step. So <clears throat> the stability is built into the implant. So you can, you can have a well-functioning knee. We actually uh, allow patients to ski afterwards, so you can, you can ski with a knee replacement. Um, yes, a question next to you. Uh, yeah, what do you resurface the knee with, and then how long does it take from start to finish of an operation, and then how long do you expect a knee replacement or resurfacing to last a person? Great question. So we'll start with the first one here. So this is actually a model of a knee replacement. I'm going to let you hold this here. What's your name? Bob. Bob. So Bob is going to have a sample here. If you want to play with it, you can just ask Bob. He'll pass it on to you. <laughs> but the, the femoral part is made out of cobalt chrome, and that's, that goes on the end of the thigh bone. I'm Same. The Thank you. Very good, yeah. So if you have any metal questions, Bob will be happy to answer those for you. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the tibial component, the top of the shin bone, that also is cobalt chrome. And the bearing in between there is made out of uh, polyethylene. It's a surgical grade plastic. Um, the operation itself, uh, Bob's second question was, how long does a surgery take? It takes roughly about an hour. So a knee replacement, a hip replacement takes about an hour. Um, there is a lot of time on the front end. So fortunately, we have very good anesthesiologists who, who uh, makes, make the patients very comfortable on the front end. So that takes about half an hour. They usually do what's called a spinal anesthetic that numbs you from the waist down. Uh, for knee replacements, they do a nerve block so they can anesthetize parts of the knee. Uh, during the surgery, we inject a cocktail of things inside the knee that helps reduce bleeding, reduces pain. Um, and then uh, they give you a little shot of whiskey through your IV so you're taking a light nap. Um, most patients don't like to hear the, the tools are very, very loud. Um, they are power tools, and so uh, you're taking a light nap during the surgery. Um, a big question that people always ask is, well, how do you know it's the right time for a joint replacement? I think this is, this is 
when we're in a patient visit, I would say half the time at least is, is addressing this particular question. And it's a very subjective question. Uh, what you first need to know is that a joint replacement is not a medical emergency, okay? So there are some things in medicine that require immediate attention. If you had a blocked heart artery, if you had appendicitis, you gotta get that taken care of yesterday, okay? The good news with hip and knee arthritis is that people can actually survive the rest of their lives with an arthritic hip or knee. It's really more a quality of life question for you. Yes, question there. You can, so that, that bearing is what we call modular. So that, that, that bearing, can we can pop it right out and put a new one in, give you another fresh 100,000 miles. <laughs> uh, same thing with the hip side. You can, you can swap out the bearing. That's a very common revision hip surgery that we do for, um, you know, the older bearings, they, they don't last, have not lasted as long. And so sometimes after, you know, 15 years or so, you'll see those bearings wear out and we could swap it out and put a new bearing in there. Um, going back to Bob's third question, I, I forgot to answer your third question about survivor survivorship. So people ask, well, how long do joint placements last? So there was a great study that came out in New York City about a year ago. They looked at a bunch of patients under the age of 55 that had knee replacements. And these were all done in the late 70s and early 80s. And they tracked these patients for over 30 years and followed these patients. And what they found at 30 years, 80% were still doing well. So that's better than we thought. We used to say 15 years, and then you gotta think about getting a new, a new knee replacement but, uh, or hip replacement. Uh, but now we know that the, the bearings are lasting uh, quite a long time. And the modern bearings that we have now are even better than the 1970s technology that we, that we used to have. Yes, question in the back. Typically, why do knee replacements or hip replacements fail? Good question. So uh, if you look at uh, top reasons for knee replacements to fail, uh, number one reason is instability, where the, the knee is too loose, it's too wiggly. And what happens there is, and that's more of a technique issue, um, if the knee is put in too loose, it tends not to be stable. And for our patients that enjoy hiking and skiing, uh, that knee doesn't become as reliable, and sometimes those knees become a little more sore. Um, for hip replacements, um, in, in the old days, it used to be bearing wear, so the, the bearings weren't as good, and the bearings would wear out. They'd, they get a a process called osteolysis, uh, where the, the plastic would basically wear. Um, infection's another um, uh, co potential cause for failure. Uh, national rates are about 4%. My personal rate is about 0.4%, so it is a potential risk. Uh, so there are risk factors prior to surgery that we try to modify. Let's say if a patient is a smoker, has uncontrolled diabetes, um, these are factors that need to be managed on the front end. Uh, which brings us to the other topic of, uh, of being fit medically uh, in order to be a, a candidate for joint replacement. And we actually have a very nice program. Dr. Cooper Smith is sitting in the front here. Uh, raise your hand, Dr. or stand up there, Dr. Cooper Smith. So we cherry picked Dr. Cooper Smith from the Hospital for Special Surgery in New York City. And he's a specialist in what we call perioperative medicine. And so um, uh, when patients come in and they are trying to see if they're a candidate for joint replacement, uh, we will have um, either the primary care physicians or Dr. Cooper Smith screen the patients to see if there are any outstanding factors that need to be addressed prior to surgery. And so let's say someone has a heart problem, they may need to be refer referred to a cardiologist. If they've got a smoking issue, they may need help quitting smoking. If they've got uncontrolled diabetes, sometimes they need to be worked up to help uh, manage that before surgery. And this really reduces the risk of complications after surgery. So we can do a great job with the carpentry piece, but if you've got medical issues that you know, keep you in the hospital, that, that's not a good thing. So yes, question. Are you using 3D imaging to determine the exact size or shape of what the replacement? Yeah, we used to. We used to. There was, a, there was a technology called custom fitting. So back in 2007, 2008, there was this uh, big move by actually all the companies across the board for custom fitting. So, you would stick your knee uh, in a CT scanner or MRI, and then you'd have these custom jigs that would sit on the ends of the bone, and then that would allow the surgeon to make some bone cuts. Unfortunately, the accuracy of those jigs have not been as perfect as we would have hoped. And so there was up to three degrees of error and up to three millimeters of error. And so if you look at the national use of that technology, essentially every company has dropped that, uh, that technology 
from their program. You can still, it's still available in theory, but um, we can get better accuracy with tech, uh, technology like computer navigation. Yes? So you use computer navigation to align the knee? Yes, I use computer navigation in every single one of my knees. And then I use uh, what we call fluoroscopy or imaging uh, for all of our hips where we can do a live x-ray. Yes? How long after the procedure does an infection occur? Well, in theory, an infection can happen any time. Uh, there's this debate about what we call antibiotic uh, prophylaxis for dental visits. Mm -hmm. So we've had this constant debate with American, any dentists in the office? I hope I'm not offending any dentists here. <laughs> but the American Dental Association and the American Academy for Orthopedic Surgeons have had this ongoing conversation over the years. And um, we, in our practice, we recommend lifelong prophylaxis. So you, you take an antibiotic by mouth an hour before your dental procedure. Because um, in theory, you, you know, your, your mouth is a very bacteria-laden environment. And if you get the dentist picking at your gums, you can get bacteria into the bloodstream. And in rare circumstances, it can settle into your joint. And so um, there's some thought that after two years, you don't need that dental prophylaxis. But we recommend it lifelong. I've actually seen patients that were 12 years after their knee replacement and got an infection. Yes? What about double knee replacement? Do you recommend doing that at the same time? Trying to at different times? So the short answer is no. But have I done double knee replacements in the past? I have. But um, the Mayo Clinic actually has some great data. They looked at 10,000 uh, patients. And they compared single to double uh, knees. And if you look at the overall numbers, there was a three time higher incidence of a major cardiac event, like a heart attack, and a four time higher incidence of a major blood clot to lungs in the bilateral knee patients. So if you were my family member, I'd say do one at a time. Uh, the, other, the other interesting thing that I've seen uh, over and over is, let's say someone's got two bad knees, and usually one's a little worse than the other. So let's say the, the right knee is a little more sore. Uh, if that one gets replaced first, three months down the road, that will become their strong knee. Their other knee may start feeling better even without surgery. So if we can buy you another 10 years out of your other knee, that's in your best interest. Why is that? So. Well, then, then you've got a good knee to stand on, and it can offload the other knee. Yeah. Um, the other common thing that people will always say is, well, I'm not getting any younger. I should do my surgery sooner than later. And the honest truth is that um, chronologic age does not disqualify you from having joint replacement surgery. So there's a great paper that looked at patients in their 90s with joint replacements and compare those patients to other age categories. And guess what? The 90-somethings did just as well as any other age bracket in terms of pain relief and functional improvement. So you don't need to let the, the, the clock push you into having surgery sooner than you, than you want to. So it's OK to procrastinate. Yes? Uh, so have you heard of the optimized positioning system that Corin is doing in Australia? And could you talk about how you position the hip optimally? Yes. Surgery? So there's a lot of different technologies in, in trying to dial in the component positioning. And really, it all comes down to the position of the components as it looks on an x-ray image. And so we, th there's a lot of different software out there that can uh, allow you to create templates to, to plan where you want your component position and then to check it during surgery. Um, we use what we call fluoroscopy. So it's actually a live x-ray that we're using in live time at the very time of your surgery. So um, at each phase of the operation, we can we, we use what we call trial parts. So anybody here like shoe shopping? <laughs> Raise your hand if you like to go shoe shopping. OK. So when you go to the shoe store, you don't just purchase the shoe that's sitting on the rack there, right? You, you try on a number of different shoes. And only when you're perfectly satisfied with the fit and the, the way it looks and, and you, you, know, you walk in it, um, then you make the actual purchase. Um, we do the same thing during surgery. So we actually have trial parts. So just like the parts that Bob was holding, we have uh, trays of instruments that are sterile of all different sizes, and we can place those parts on there, and we can check it and double check it, use imaging, use navigation, and make sure that we're perfectly satisfied with the way that it fits, the stability, the motion, before we actually buy the real parts. And then once we're happy with that, then we open the real parts and implant those in place. 
So, yes, question way, way back. What's your name? Uh, Mary Jo. Mary Jo. <laughs> I'm sorry, you're going to have to speak up a little bit louder, Mary Jo. Old Great question, Mary Jo. So Mary Jo is asking about what happens when your, your previous knee replacement wears out. Well, there is something called revision knee replacements or revision hip replacements. So um, you can redo a joint replacement, and it all depends on what wears out or what the issue is. So sometimes it's, it's just the bearing, where you can just swap the bearing out. And that's actually a pretty quick operation that uh, allows your recovery to be very, very rapid. Um, if, it's, if the metal parts come loose, then it's a little more extensive. So sometimes the metal parts can be loose, you could have bone loss, and we have little augments and shims and stems. Um, we've got a pretty big toolbox to, to rebuild where bone has been lost. So yes, uh, joints can be redone. Um, after parts wear out or things come loose, uh, sometimes people go skiing and they will break a bone around a joint replacement, and yes, those can be fixed or, or refixed. Something you want to try to avoid in general, but <laughs> yes, another question in the way back there. Are you seeing or using these stem cells in your practice uh, or in this area now? Is there help with the softening and healing or uh, in any way should form? Great question. So stem cell. Um, I think there's probably going to be some useful application for stem cell in the joint replacement world to try to help with some of the recovery aspects and some of the soft tissue healing. Um, Stay tuned because we've got some interesting projects that we're going to try to launch. Um, if you take, take a, a step back and talk about, you know, are there uh, ways that stem cells can, can help to avoid joint replacement, I think that there are uh, some, some really bright researchers right here in Vail that are exploring that. And uh, Linda could probably point you in the right direction with uh, some of our other colleagues. Um, that are really involved in the stem cell research and actually doing some stem cell procedures. So um, we kind of see them after you know they've tried everything, and you know again the the pavement is completely gone, and they've tried you know X, Y, or Z treatments. So I'm not the right person to ask about stem cell treatment to you know avoid surgery. Yes. Yeah. So, great question. So, um, they're talking about alignment in in knees, and everybody's got. You send them to Dr. Hackett. <laughs> well, yes. Yeah, so, if if someone's bow legged and their their articular cartilage is perfect, then they don't need a joint replacement. They actually need a, an align, realignment procedure to help correct the way they they stand and function. And that's actually a, a, an operation called the osteotomy. That's something that um, uh, the sports docs, Dr. Hackett and so forth, uh, can do to correct and realign uh, the limb. Um, with joint replacements, uh, we know that everybody's lined up a little, dip, little bit differently. Some people are a little more bowed, some people are a little more knock-kneed. And we do like to correct the alignment as part of the operation. So uh, we know that knee replacements will function better with a well-aligned limb. It's kind of like if you're wheels are out of alignment, well, what happens to your tires? They wear out faster. So a similar thing happens in, in a knee. If you leave the knee bow-legged, then it, it doesn't function very well. Now, there's a such thing as overcorrecting. So you don't want to take a bow-legged person and make them knock knee because then that knee's not going to function well. Um, but we do like to correct it. And we can do that with na computer navigation very, very well. Yes? So interesting thing happens. We've, I, I've looked at a lot of x-rays over the past 11 years in practice. And sometimes what actually happens is that when you straighten out one limb, it actually helps the other leg stand up straighter and creates sort of what, we, what I call a splinting effect. And so um, sometimes that, is that what happened to you? Yeah. So in the end, you'll be a little bit taller. Um, now, <laughs> does, it, does, it fix, does it fix the, uh, you know, the underlying pathology of, of what's going on in the other, other knee, it may not, but it, it, may, it may help. So we're, gonna, we're running out of time here. I want to give Ashley some time here. But the bottom line is you know, people always ask, well, how do I know it's time for a joint replacement? And I kind of 
equate it to, well, how did you know it was time to get married? And, <laughs> and uh, you can't really see this here, but yeah. on, the, on the bottom of this guy's shoes, he uh, I lost, yeah, he's got help me there. Hopefully you won't get to that point. <laughs> But you'll, you'll just know, you'll just know. You know, a switch will go off, the light will go off, and you'll just know it's time. Um, and, and again, you don't need to rush into surgery, you don't need to uh, think that it's a medical emergency, but your joint will let you know. So I'm gonna be around afterwards to answer any other questions, and so uh, really appreciate you guys being here. Um, there's some exciting stuff in the therapy world that uh, Ash is gonna talk to you about. Um, some accelerated protocols. We're again, we're doing these outpatient now, um, so stay tuned for a whole another talk here. Ashley. Hi everybody. Can you all hear me back there? I'm doing a little mic check on this. Can you raise your hand if you can hear me in the back? All right. So my name is Ashley Dentler. Um, I am been introduced by Doris and Dr. Kim, so thank you for that. I am an inpatient physical therapy manager at Vail Valley Medical Center. Um, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about some of this stuff, and if you didn't pay attention the first time around, I'll let you get a couple notes in because I'm kind of repeat some of this stuff. So let's see if we can get this thing to go. There we go. So I'm originally from Rhode Island. People ask me all the time, what the heck are you doing out here? How did you get here? Decided to landlock myself away from the ocean and decided to play in the mountains. So I've been here for a little bit. Came from Boston. Um, Got my doctorate of physical therapy at Northeastern University, if you guys are familiar with New England. It's a great city. Um, I've been working with Howard Head and Vail Valley Medical Center now for five, six years and been very intimately involved in kind of bringing on the joint replacement stuff once Dr. Kim arrived, which has been super exciting for all of us. So this is where you get to start looking at your nose and see if you figured out this the first time. So here we go. The uh, osteoarthritis, as Dr. Kim had talked about, is the wear and tear arthritis. Typically, it's going to be seen in your hips and knees, which is what we're here to talk about today. However, there's plenty of other joints that we have that are going to experience this, such as your spine, your shoulders, your hands. I'm sure all of you, as a raise of hands, have felt this in more joints than just your knees and hips. Um, so what causes arthritis? As we talked about before, this is going to be the wear and tear of your cartilage. The cartilage is on any end of your bones. If you guys like eating chicken, just like Dr. Kim had said, you're going to see this shiny stuff on the end of all your bones. So the wear and tear is gonna happen there. You're gonna to start to feel a little bit of that pain once the cartilage starts to wear away and you're gonna get what's called that bone on bone. All can say that we probably have had these aches and pains before. You can see how there's going to be a significant difference in what a nice, normal, healthy joint's going to look like in comparison to what a joint with the cartilage removed. You start to see that malformation. It starts to look kind of ugly. And that's where you guys are probably all shaking your head saying, yeah, that's why I hurt. <laughs> So, signs and symptoms of hip and knee arthritis. We've all talked about this. I hurt in the morning. I have pain. It's inflamed. It's big. It's fat. It's red. It's ugly. All of these are pretty similar. Not of the heads. Yeah. Okay. So, one of the other things that we typically see as therapists is going to be a common conversation with our patients, particularly up here, that say, I used to be able to walk 18 holes of golf, and now I'm riding in a cart, which really kind of stinks. I used to be able to go and ride up Vail Pass, no problem, and now I'm on the bike path. I was walking up 14ers and all of a sudden I'm going on the flat grounds. Does it all sound kind of familiar to you guys if you've experienced this before? So this is where I get to come in and I get to tell you guys how we might be able to give you a little bit of time before you end up going to see Dr. Kim. Some of the risk factors. Age, for sure. Age is your strongest risk factor for developing osteoarthritis. Granted, there's definitely younger patients that experience OA, especially if they've had some kind of trauma to the joint previously or other surgeries that may lead to an increased uh, risk factor for OA. Gender, there's a great mix of both male and female in this audience, so we both experience just as much um, incidence of OA. However, typically, if we're gonna see patients under the age of 45, we're gonna see more incidence of men. Joint injury. So two different types of things that happen here. We have those overuse injuries, and we also have our traumatic injuries. People that have had trauma to their joints before, previous surgeries, you took a real bad ski fall, and then all of a sudden you're like, whoa, this isn't feeling so great a couple years later. Those people are gonna experience the post-traumatic OA. Then you have your overuse patients. Overuse is gonna be seen by people that like the skiing, the hiking, the biking, the loading injuries, and they just love to keep going. 
However, you also have the people that have demanding jobs. So you're going to have your plumbers, your manual labor, your construction, things that are going to pre-expose you over a lifetime of working really hard on your joints, and they're going to start to talk to you after a while. Weight. So we talk about weight loss all the time pre-op to make sure that you guys are going to not only be healthy for these experiences, but you're also ready to experience a wonderful life afterwards with weight loss. It's going to decrease the stress on these joints um, and give you a little bit more pain relief. Genetics. There, are, there is a genetic component to arthritis. Some people have less ability to build that cartilage, and so therefore they're pre-exposed to having the OA develop faster. And joint alignment, as we talked about. Knock knee versus uh, bow-leggedness, which knock knee and bow-leggedness is going to increase stress on one side of the joint as compared to the other. Therefore, you're going to start feeling some of those symptoms a little quicker. So as we talked about, we've got the non-surgical and the surgical treatment of OA. Well, first one on the list, which is why I'm here, is going to be physical therapy. One of the things that we always like to do is try to evaluate and treat what's going on with you, not just at your knee or just at your hip. We're looking at the entire person. It's a very, very um, important aspect of what we can do as a therapist because we don't want to just look at what's going on at the joint level. We want to talk about what's going on at the global level. NSAIDs, or anti-inflammatories, Aleve, we talked about that. Massage, rubbing it, what feels good. You've got NSAIDs that you can take that are over the counter, as well as anything that the physician may prescribe for you. Um, low impact cardio exercise, things that are going to involve doing less of the loaded joint stuff that really causes you more pain and discomfort. Um, weight reduction program, we talked about doing some types of diets and things that have worked very well to reduce the weight that you're actually carrying on those joints that don't feel great. And then you can always end up going into the surgical interventions where we've talked about, and you guys are a very intelligent audience, um, injections as well as other types of restorative surgeries and then, of course, the joint replacement. So what is PT's role prior to a joint replacement surgery? We've, I've heard yoga in the audience. I've heard you know, weight loss as a potential option for being able to stave off some of these surgeries, giving yourself a little bit more time. Well, from a PT standpoint, like I said, we're going to look at you from the whole person standpoint. Not only what's going on with your joint, but what else do you want to be doing? And what can we do to help modify that to give you a little bit more time and enjoyment of your quality of life? So we end up looking at everything. We rule out any other contributing factors that might be causing some of your pain. If you have any flexibility issues, if you have strength deficits, if you, like the, Dr. Kim had said, they walk up and sneak behind you and take a look at what you're walking like before you end up showing up to the office, we already know what might be going on. However, we can look at these things and we can say A plus B equals C. And we can address A and B first. And if C is the joint replacement, at least we're looking at the whole picture. So the other thing, too, the do's and the don'ts. If you're saying to me that you absolutely love doing aerials on your skis and you're landing hard on your joints, well, I'm probably going to tell you not to do that anymore until we can figure out other things that are going on, unless you really like that, guys. It's okay. Um, but also the communication aspect, and I can't overemphasize this. Physical therapy, particularly here in the Vail Valley with working with our surgeons so closely, we absolutely overemphasize the amount of communication between patient, therapist, surgeon, groups, et cetera. So we start that talk and that, um, that conversation very early on, whether you already know you're having the replacement or, you know what, I think you might be a good candidate to go up and have a chat with them. So um, choosing the right exercises. So when we're talking about that low impact cardio stuff, I know we all end up being up here because we love our activities. So trying to keep you as active as possible pre and post is our goal. So activities such as cycling, swimming, being able to get on an elliptical, which is going to be a little bit of an off-weighted machine, and maybe hiking with poles, some kind of support systems to do the things you love doing, is going to keep you active prior to and post-surgery. Um, other aspects, which we're going to talk about right now, the training side of things with either endurance, your balance, flexibility, and of course your strength. So lower body flexibility. A couple of great pictures. Hopefully some of you guys can get into some of these positions without hurting yourself. Um, addressing some of the musculature that is surrounding these joints is going to help us to be able to um, identify some compensations, improve your range of motion, as well as be able to say, hmm, this just doesn't look right on each side. So we are able to say, let's focus on this in order to be able to get better flexibility, range of motion, and strength in return. Balance exercises. How many of you guys have excellent balance? <laughs> 
right? So we all could probably work on this. However, being able to do some of these things preoperatively is going to help you feel a little bit safer as well as have confidence post-joint surgery. A couple of exercises here that can show you simple ways of being able to look and see where your baseline is. Lower body strength. So all of you guys are probably thinking, well, wow, my joint's been so painful, I can't really use it that well because it hurts. So therefore, when you don't use it, it becomes weaker. There's a couple things that we like to prescribe ahead of time that allow you to do strengthening exercises that are going to take the weight off, decrease the stress, but still work on identifying some of those really, really important muscles that are going to be around all of these joints. The clicker works. There we go. So why am I up here in comparison to some other therapists in the valley, which we all know a stone's throw away, you're going to hit a PT clinic if you live close. So Howard Head, not only is we are a very large um, department within or a clinic within our valleys, both Summit County and Vail, but we are very specialized in the idea that we are going to be one-on-one -on -one with you no matter what. We are focusing not on your symptoms, but we're truly addressing your problems. And by addressing the problems, we're going to be able to identify some of your long-term things that you want to get back to doing. So we take a very specific approach to each individual person. It's not just come in, yep, you're a joint replacement and we're going to send you on. We're going to say, what do you want to do? And I think that that is something that we are very unique in our approach to being able to provide that type of service. So what to expect before surgery? Here's a couple slides that I needed to click through for you. So we are hugely involved in education. We want to make sure that when you come here, which is why all of you are probably here now, what do you need to know? Who do I need to be involved in talking with? And how do I get ready for this to be as successful as possible? So we encourage our patients to come and see us prior to surgery in order to be able to come to a one-on-one -on -one PT visit. And we do strongly encourage that you bring a caregiver or somebody with you that's going to help to take care of you after surgery because, let's be honest, sometimes it takes a village. So we like to have you come in. We do a visit, and we go through everything from a home safety assessment to pre and post exercises to be able to get you nice and strong. Any types of expectations, not only from the surgery, but our expectations of you as well, because we want you to be the best you, so we need to get you involved and participate too. And any kind of discharge questions. What am I going to be able to do? What do I, how do I do this? Who do I need to help me? We spend a lot of time going through every single one of your individual questions in order to make you as successful as possible. So how about after surgery? You already know you're going to do this. Now what? Well, at VVMC, Howard Head, you are going to be seen immediately after by one of our therapists. Myself or one of my other colleagues will come to see you, and as Dr. Kim explained, you have spinal anesthesia, you get that whiskey shot, you take a nap with him, and then you come work with me. So you're going to actually get up walking almost a few hours after surgery. We really push the function pretty quickly. Um, the anesthesia wears off, we're going to get you up, we're going to make sure that you feel comfortable, you're probably going to have a nice doughy smile on your face and you're going to feel wonderful. <laughs> Maybe sit you in a chair after that. But um, PT is going to end up doing a little bit of gentle range of motion and exercises to start you off on the right foot and this is truly hours after your surgery. You're then going to be seen potentially by an occupational therapist. This person is going to work with you and your caregiver as well as address any concerns that you have about how do I get in the shower? How do I get dressed? How do I go get the mail? And oh yeah, how do I go to the grocery store and cook and all these things? They also spend a significant amount of time in order to be able to set you up for success with what it does it look like when you leave the hospital? Some people are very nervous about, well, you guys did all this stuff here for me, now what? So we take a lot of time to address those types of concerns. Knee replacement. A little bit further out, we're looking at you guys starting some physical therapy within the second day after surgery. We really want to emphasize starting off with the strengthening program, range of motion, getting rid of your swelling and inflammation. And we're working on those gait compensations and the, the difficulty walking that you walked into the office with. We're going to start working on that because we want to get you back to full function. We also would like to have you avoid those aerials that you all like to do when you're skiing or you know those jumps that you do on your bikes and things like that. However, we do want to get back to function. Similarly with the hip, we're also working on those gait compensations. We want to be able to get you off of your crutches and walkers pretty quickly so we can get you back out there and enjoying and having fun. We do um, 
suggest that you keep away from some of those really far end ranges. I don't know how many of you enjoy yoga and Pilates, but some of those are a little bit um, difficult to get back to, so we try to avoid those initially. And then we're also trying to keep you from doing the, the jumps and fun things like that. So six weeks after joint replacement, we're still working on those gait compensations that you guys have had from long-standing time spent on these really painful joints. So we're really working with you guys to adjust your strength to increase that range of motion and get you back to that full function. It, the strengthening program looks a little similar to the pre-op and acutely post-op, and then we start to tailor to those very functional and activity-specific exercises that in the three to six month time frame, we're looking to get you back to doing. So we are looking at trying to get you back to full function and all the things you love to enjoy by that three to six month time frame, depending on what types of tricks you guys want to be able to do. So common questions. Can I get back to skiing? Absolutely. That's what we do here, right? However, some thought process in terms of modifying what days you might want to go out, what terrain you guys are hitting, and how long or how frequent you're going to be doing this, OK? Hiking, absolutely. Grab a couple poles if you think you're going to be doing stuff that's pretty intense, because I know that we all like to do things like that. Golf, hopefully we can get you back to walking and out of that cart again, or some modification of both. And biking. Absolutely, we want you guys to be able to go back to doing the things that you love. So hopefully, the bike path won't be the only place you go. Are there any nutritional components to healing after surgeries and so on that you would recommend that would really accelerate and improve? So my license says I can't tell you that. However, <laughs> <laughs> so we know nutrition is very important. It's important before surgery and after surgery. Um, there are medical conditions. Um, where if patients are malnourished, so uh, we check a certain number of uh, lab tests, including albumin, lymphocyte count, protein levels. If they are very low, then they're actually at higher risk for infection uh, after, after surgery. And so um, we, we know protein and all that's an important building block for healing, but we're, we're actually more concerned about the infection risk if, if someone's malnourished. Um, there's, there's a little bit of a, um, there's a lot of data that's been out recently talking about um, obesity and joint replacements, and we know that um, at very high, what we call body mass indexes, um, infection risks are higher. Um, so some people will go on these sort of funny crash diets where they'll try to lose a ton of weight, um, and if they're not taking enough protein in, um, they will actually, even though their, their weight may drop, and that may get them a lower infection risk. Because of the, the malnourishment, they may actually be at a higher infection risk. Um, so there's a balance to how, how to do that appropriately. So if people are trying to get a little more fit um, before surgery, we, we recommend making sure that they consume enough protein, making sure they're, they're not on one of these you know, funny you know, fad diets that's going to cause actually malnutrition. Um, I, the one vitamin I think that is important is vitamin D. That's uh, number one, it's important for bone density. Um, but there's also some early data that says that that may have an effect on infection as well. People with very, very low vitamin D levels might be a little more prone to infection. Um, but the other vitamins, you know, if you're, if you're eating a healthy diet, you know, or maybe taking a multivitamin on a regular basis, that's adequate. You don't need to go over the top and take, you know, go to GNC and spend a thousand bucks on, you know, blue pills or red pills or, you know. There are hundreds and hundreds of different makes and models and uh, across Colorado, across the country. And uh, we know that there are implants that have not done well. Like if you watch late night television, you'll see uh, lawyer commercials about metal and metal hip replacements <laughs> and things that have gone bad. Um, it, so there are implants that have not done well. But for the most part, in general, there are a lot of implants that do very, very well. Um, we know that as surgeons, it's more important how the implant is put in as opposed to the make and model. So, you know, if, if I've got a family member in 
Cleveland that says, well, you know, how do I decide where to go and what implant to pick? I, I would say, forget about the brand of the implant. I would say pick the surgeon that's going to take care of you. That's the most important piece. Right, right. It, it all depends on what wears out. So the weak link is typically the bearing. Um, so again, if the metal parts are well fixed and well lined, uh, you can just swap out the bearing. Um, yes, there are scenarios where sometimes we have to replace even the entire, the entire knee and replace uh, a lot of parts. Um, same thing in the hip. Um, but it, it all depends on what wears out. In terms of timing, yes, the, the longer you wait chronologically in age, the less chance there is that you will need a revision in your lifetime. Uh, but it really comes down to a quality of life question for you. So uh, we've got patients even in their 40s or 30s, and I've had a handful of patients in their 20s that have had completely trashed joints to the point where they're literally wheelchair bound. And so they might say, well, I'm willing to have a joint replacement at a younger age, knowing that I may need a subsequent surgery or two down the future. Um, but I'm willing to do that from a quality of life standpoint. So you know, everybody's got their own expectations as to um, what they want to do in life. And you know, there, there are patients that will say, you know what, I don't want surgery, even if it means I have to live in a motorized wheelchair for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you'll have patients that will say, you know what, if I can't walk 18 holes, my life is over, so replace my knee tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And most people are somewhere in between there. But again, it's a very subjective decision-making process. And, and uh, only you know how much that knee bothers you. Yes? What infection rate have you experienced? So uh, national rates are about 4%. My personal rate is 0.4%. So it, it's, it's, uh, it is a real um, potential complication risk. And again, we, we are very particular about trying to assess risk before surgery and to manage risk and to, to minimize risk before surgery. So that's very important. Yes? So um, I have a question about recovery, which is like if I do PT before and I just get all, you know, uh, prepped up, I come to you for surgery. Um, does by individuality of my body affect someone else who did the same thing, who did the same regime? I guess what I'm saying, because I've had, I've known people that have had knee surgeries and it hasn't gone well, and mm -hmm. other people, you know, that they were like skiing like two weeks later almost, you know. Yeah, so the question is, what, why does one person have a good outcome with a knee replacement versus another in terms of therapy and motion? We know that there are biologic factors that, mm -hmm. that can cause scarring or have more scarring. We know patients with previous open knee surgery, like a big... Uh, ligament reconstruction or fixing broken bones, they're more predisposed to having scarring after a knee replacement. They're at higher risk uh, compared to someone that's never had surgery before. Um, there's probably some biologic factors like, you know, if you look at some people's scars, sometimes you can hardly see a line because their, their skin just heals so well. Other people have a little more of what we call a keloid where it's a little more looks a little more inflamed. So everybody's, we know people's collagen or the, the tissues heal in a different rate. Mm -hmm. um, but we do know the importance of therapy to, to combat that scarring. So in the old days, when they did a knee replacement, everybody was placed in a cast for two weeks. Mm -hmm. And guess what? They got pretty stiff. Mm -hmm. And so the manipulation rate, so what meaning uh, the percentage of patients after a knee replacement back in the old days when they were in a cast uh, that needed a manipulation where under anesthesia, you'd give, a, give the knee a little squeeze, was about 50%. So we've learned that moving the knee early and using the therapy resources and getting mobilized has had tremendous benefit and reduced the scarring rates. So we do know that therapy is, is an important piece. We have enough time for one more question. 
Jeff, we're going to let you pick the, the, the lucky winner of the final question. So I do. Uh, so their um, partial needs are a good operation for, for a very small subset of patients that have a perfectly normal knee otherwise. So if they've got wear and tear in the rest of the knee, they're typically not a good candidate. So actually one of the common reasons for revision surgery uh, that, that we've seen is, is failed partial knee replacements. So I think the, the key to a successful partial knee is selecting the perfect candidate to make sure that they're, you know, the rest of the knee is, is uh, in good shape. We're going to wrap up today's group session. Uh, what a great topic. Can we give a round of applause to both of our speakers today?